How's it going? Good. It's, it's just uh, unbelievable. You drop down, and there it is. We've got a line on the bow right now, and you can see 100 feet, John. Because the water is so clear, it's obvious that Mrs. Sinawa is broken in two. The forward section is lying on its port side, with the deck turned 90 degrees to the sandy bottom, while the after section and the majority of the ship is, is flipped and twisted completely upside down with the deck pressed hard into the seabed. Dropping down off the forward section, you come into a no man's land, this huge expanse of torn and ripped material, decks, machinery. And it was somewhere in this area that I think the Kaitan struck, detonating the fumes and the remaining aviation fuel that was still inside the tank in that area. This was a cursory dive, a chance to get a sense of the wreck and to get my bearings on the bottom. It was part of the plan that would allow us to systematically work our way through the entire wreck site, eventually eliminating all the possible areas in which a portion of the Kaitan might be found. If there was a section of the Kaitan that survived the impact and explosion, I thought it might be covered by the overturned wreck. If I could make my way under the Mississinewa, there was a chance that it might still be visible. Pushing under the starboard rail and bulwarks, I made my way under the wreck. In some places, the deck is clear from the seabed by as much as two meters. And you can clearly see the plumbing and the valve assemblies that let you know that this ship is an oil tanker. In some areas, you can see the light streaming in through from the far side and at times there's very little headroom. It was important to push into these confined areas, the space between the deck and the seabed. We had to eliminate this area first before we could explore out from under the wreck and around on the sandy bottom. No one suspected that a Kite 10 had brought about the sinking of Mississinewa for the simple reason that this was the first successful use of the weapon. It was not only a unique event in naval history, but for the Allies, a very disturbing new development in the war for control of the Pacific. And that's why the Sea Hunters are here. Our objective is to explore the wreck site and to document on the bottom this singular event, and if possible, locate a remnant of this horrifying new weapon a weapon that not only destroyed a ship and killed 63 men, but also sent to the bottom millions of liters of oil, an environmental time bomb that had to be defused. It was odd to see the deck turn sideways and appearing like a wall with the heavy deck machinery hanging as if defying gravity. Moving back along that turn deck, I located Mrs. Sinema's forward gun. Although she was an oil tanker used for refueling the fleet, she did carry her own armament. And this looked to me to be one of her three-inch guns. On the center line of the forward deck, you could clearly see an open hatch. It's cover gone, probably blown off the morning of the explosion. This was one of the main centerline tanks. Moving inside, it turned out to be this huge cavernous area. You can only imagine the explosive potential of a tank like this if it were filled with gasoline or aviation fuel. 